So in this video, I thought I'd answer some of your questions that you have about hiking in the Pyrenees, whether you've thought about doing something like the GR11 or the HRP before, or you're just interested to see how through hiking here compares to wherever you're from. I think you'll get a lot of that for this video, especially if you're into long distance hiking. All right, let's get into it. First question is about wild camping from Michael Mountain Runner who says, do you know if wild camping is permitted in Spain, France in the Pyrenees? Yes, it absolutely is. Sometimes you'll find other conflicting information and I think that's because each park has their different rules. Certainly down in the south of Spain, the Sierra Nevada, I know the rules are a lot stricter, but generally in the Pyrenees, if you're above say 1800 or I think 2000 meters in some parks, you're able to completely wild camp on your own. But it's really common on the Pyrenean through hikes to utilize the manned huts so there is refuges throughout the entire mountain range and they will be supplying your bed your dinner and your breakfast in the morning sometimes they even provide a packed lunch for you but generally if you're around those huts you can't wild camp near them sometimes they'll have little areas set apart where you can pay a nominal amount and just camp and eat your own food most of the time if you're camping you'll have to be spending some money like eating dinner and breakfast within the hut but just check with each hut as you go but if you're not planning on utilizing the huts there's a whole bunch of other options there's little cabanas like unmanned huts uh, in scotland they call them bothies a lot of the time they're just little tin sheds with a concrete floor you put your mat down and it's a great way to save time putting up your tent uh, a lot of them are pretty clean and very usable and so in a pinch they're great to use as well but for the most part wild camping is totally fine in the Pyrenees just stay away from arable land farmed areas don't go into private property and obviously don't do it anywhere towns and populated areas you want to keep your wild camping wild that means nowhere near roads so generally up high above 2000 meters is fine I'm going to get to the next question in a minute, but first I want to thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creators to explore new skills, deepen existing passions and get lost in creativity. They've got tons of classes for creative and curious people on topics like freelancing, photography and video, especially for YouTube. One of my favorite classes is How to Speak Confidently on Camera, a guide for content creators with Nathaniel Drew. With the main takeaway here being that you'll be most confident speaking about things you're already knowledgeable and interested in. Like most classes on Skillshare, it's under 60 minutes with short lessons to fit any schedule. Best of all, Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads and they're always launching new premium classes so you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. It's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. Now the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of the premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Jan asks, how much gas did you use? Could you get gas cartridges in the villages you passed through? Did you ever cook on the campfire? Is it allowed? To answer the last question, no, it's not allowed to have fires in the Pyrenees. So I didn't cook on a campfire, but in terms of gas, for my whole trip that was like a month long, I think I used about three of those 250 mil cans. I picked up my first bottle in Elizondo. That's one of the first towns when you're walking from the Basque countryside heading east. I think I picked up another one in Parzan and then another one in La Joncaria. So pretty much every major town you walk through, and there's a lot of them in the Pyrenees, a lot of those major towns will have a ferreteria or like a hardware store. And that's generally where I would find the gas. Occasionally they are at supermarkets. If you're flying in, you won't be able to bring your gas canister from home, obviously, so you'll have to buy one there. But if you wanna know exactly which towns and which stores have gas bottles, then you can pick up either one of these Cicerone guides. There's one for the GR10 as well. And that'll tell you exactly where you'll be able to find your type of gas canister. There's three different types of gas canisters that are sold in the Pyrenees. There's the original, the easy click, and then the typical MSR Coleman style gas bottles as well. The other thing about food and gas resupplying that I think you should be aware of, especially in Spain, is that 
We have a siesta here. It starts at about two o'clock in the afternoon and goes until five, meaning that all of the stores will be closed. They'll also probably be closed all Sunday, maybe only open half of Saturday. So it's really useful to keep that in mind when you are planning to come into town or passing through towns in order to resupply. You'll have to get there as early as possible to make sure you get there before the shops shut at two or come later in the afternoon when they reopen at five. Worst case scenario, you get there at two, it's closed, you have a couple of beers and wait for it to reopen. Morgs says, if you're on the HRP in August, I hope I bump into you. Yes, I will be on the HRP in August. I would love to see you. Morgs has also had a little bit of knee pain. Ironically, I've been enjoying your videos to fix the knee. So thank you for the information. I'm glad you're making some progress with that, man. Good for you. Get in there and do the work. And for anyone else that's having knee issues, seriously, check out my Mountain Proof Knees program. It's 10 bucks a week for 12 weeks. There is a lot to learn in there, a lot to go through. And we've had some amazing results so far for people that have completely eliminated their knee pain and become far more proficient and powerful hikers in the process. So check out the link in the description for Mountain Proof Knees. Rob J Bell asks, what month is best for this trek for weather conditions? Good question. As a lot of these mountains have high passes, it's not really possible to do before June. I'm sure, you could make this a mountaineering trip and start earlier, bringing ice axes and crampons, but that's really gonna slow you down. Most people don't start until the last week of June, and from then onwards, it gets a lot warmer, the snow banks start to melt, and those passes become a lot easier to get through. For me, I prefer to start in August. That just means that I don't have to carry any of that heavy equipment. I know that by August, most of those snow banks are gonna be gone, and then it's just something that I don't have to think about. I personally wouldn't start any later than, say, the last day of August. I think once you get into September, the weather can be particularly bad in the Catlin Pyrenees. We get some storms and some rain and some wind. And then once you get closer to October, that really starts pushing into the time where you could potentially have snowfall. So you definitely want to get out of there by end of September. Patrick Carmels says the H in Oort is silence. Yes, I'm probably going to forget that and keep saying Hort, but just so you know, I'm trying. Farmer Spud asks, hey Chase, I know there's a small number of black bears in the Pyrenees, any worries? Just puts me off hiking in Europe sometimes. I wouldn't be put off with it. I think there's probably only about eight black bears in the Pyrenees. They've only just been reintroduced along with wolves and some uh, other species that became extinct a long time ago. The Pyrenees is a huge area. This is only a really small amount of animals and there is so many marmots for these bears to eat. I don't think they're going to be bothered hunting down people. I personally wouldn't worry about it but if you really want to you can bring some bear spray and then do all the normal precautionary things like looking after your food, maybe throwing it in a tree but I have certainly never seen anyone do that in the Pyrenees and I think it'll be a long time before the bear population gets that high that we have to worry about it. SCL asks, do you have any experience with ticks? By far the most dangerous animal, I think, in the Pyrenees. I really suggest bringing a tick remover or tweezers and learning how to take them out properly. Being Australian, I've got a lot of experience in this and my recommendation is to get in as close as you possibly can, try and get their head with the very end of the tweezers if you're using them and try and pull them out from the head because you don't want to have the head left in there. That's going to be bad news. Getting Lyme disease is not going to be cool. Having said all that, I've never had a tick in the Pyrenees. Hopefully I never will have one. So they're not rampant, at least at the times that I've been going there. SEL also asks, do you have any experience with sleeping in a hammock on long distance hike? Do you think this would be an option for the GR11? I am not a hammock guy. I had a really bad night's sleep in a hammock in a jungle in Cambodia one time. And from then on, that was it for me. I generally sleep on my side or on my stomach, so I'm not a hammock guy. To the second part of your question though, would it be possible? Yes, but it's probably not ideal. There's not always forested areas. On the GR11, I would generally camp in a forested area just for the protection and the warmth underfoot. But a lot of the time we're out in fairly exposed alpine meadows and occasionally on a ridge and there's no trees there. So yes, you can, but you're probably gonna have to be really selective and you're gonna have to sleep down a lot lower. For the HRP, that situation's going to be even worse. There's gonna be less trees because you'd be staying up higher more often. Mark asks, how many navigation tools will you be using, app or a guidebook? So I definitely utilize the Cicerone guidebooks. I highly recommend getting them. I bought them in the paper version so I can chill at home and flick through them and read them. And then I buy the digital version on my phone so I can have those notes without taking the weight 
of the book. Last year for an app I used Locust Maps. This year I'm going to be using Outdoor Active. The maps are much better, it's easier to use, you can plot far easier, you can plot on your phone. Uh, I'm going to do a whole video about how I'm planning my route and the software I'm using, so hang out for that. I'll link it up here when it's done. So if you're doing any of the GR routes, like the 10, the 11, the 7, these are probably going to be pretty well marked and you'll see that there's mainly three types of markings that you'll see. There's the two lines, which means you're on the trail, everything's going good. There is the corner sign, which means obviously you're going to turn left or right, depending on which way it's pointing. And then there's the cross, which means, hey, you've just recently started going in the wrong direction. You're heading off trail, spin around and find the two lines. And this makes it really easy to navigate. I mean, certainly you should have a guidebook and it's a great idea to get that mapping software from Outdoor Active or all trails or whatever you want to use. But the fact is that these are all marked trails and it's actually pretty hard to get lost by having that apping software as a backup plan and perhaps even a map and a compass if you're old school is a really good idea. When it comes to the HRP, things are a little bit different. This isn't a mapped route and it's quite ambiguous the way you choose. The HRP is really kind of a philosophy. You can select a lot of different variants and kind of choose your own adventure along the way. So it's not really marked. And for that reason, my navigation and my planning is going to be a lot more significant this year. I'm gonna to have to put a little bit more effort into that. And that's part of why I chose this. This is a little bit of a challenge. He also asked how many town resupply points are there? Depends on which route you're doing, but in general, you'll pass through a town about every three or four days, sometimes every day. But obviously not all towns have the same facility. It's gonna be different in every town. That's why getting the guidebook is basically essential to find out which towns have got what. This will allow you to plan your food and gas usage around every three or four days, meaning that you don't have to do all of this planning beforehand. You can kind of wing it, which is one of the great things about hiking in the Pyrenees. It's quite easy. Rod Nemi asks, do you need a lot of mountaineering experience to hike the HRP? I would say no, but it's definitely gonna help. I mean, there is no point on the HRP where you have to tie into a rope. There may be some handrails every now and then that you'll have to grab onto, but I wouldn't say that mountaineering experience like on snow and ice and glaciers is essential, no. What is probably essential is that you have a good understanding of how your body works, especially in high places. You probably wouldn't want to go into this with an incredibly bad fear of heights and if you sort of suffer from vertigo. So just being more comfortable on that kind of terrain will help. So that kind of high mountain hiking experience is definitely essential, but not so much mountaineering. Although they do classify the HRP as a mountaineering route. Plant powered tea, I think that's Thomas, hey mate, asks, what's your estimated cost budget for the HRP through hike? And did you do any calculation or financial summary of the GR11? I had a quick look at my bank statement and I remembered the amount of cash that I had when I started. And I put that together and figured that it was around a thousand euros. And this is a really good general rule that you can stick to, especially from the US. I noticed that a lot of other content creators are saying that you spend around about a thousand US dollars in a month. And I think that rings true to the Pyrenees as well. But rather than US dollars, it'll be a thousand euros. Having said that, you can make this a lot cheaper. If you don't stay in refuges at all, if you are conservative with the kind of food you buy, if you don't drink too many beers, It would be nice if you could through hike and save money, but it doesn't really work like that. It's still a pretty expensive thing to do. And certainly most of your expenses will come in preparing the gear and getting the flights and probably taking the time off work as well. I've had a lot of questions about water in the Pyrenees. Water in the Pyrenees is great. You absolutely have to filter it though. There is a high concentration of farmed animals in these areas. So you definitely need to have a filter or a treatment source of some way. I like to use the Cadogan Bee Free. It's super easy to use. There are many situations in the Pyrenees where you're gonna be drinking water from the same place that animals drink from, whether it's a trough or a stream. So it's very, very important that you treat the water. Grab one of these Bee Free filters. They are great. Makes everything super easy and you can basically forget about it. Where possible, I like to drink from streams that are up high, that are basically trickling through rock, so it naturally kind of gets filtered. But in any case, you want to stay well away from animals and you always want to filter it. In terms of volume on the GR11, I only had a capacity of about three liters. This year on the HRP, I'm going to take four liters at least, I think. 
And then keep in mind that if you're gonna be camping away from water sources that you'll need at least two liters for a dry camp. By the time you cook, wash up, drink some water in the evening and the morning, you wanna have two liters. I try and have at least that, maybe two and a half, three for a dry camp. So the next couple of videos I've got coming up are really about sharing this journey that I'm going on with you guys. I wanna show you what I'm doing with my training, how I'm planning at my route, how I'm going to navigate the trip, and of course, what I'm taking for gear along the way. If I didn't answer your question in this video, then more than likely I answered it in my other, older Q&A video about the Pyrenees. I'll link it up here so you can check it out. But otherwise, thank you for watching. Thank you for interacting with me, commenting, and being part of this community. I've actually learned so much from you guys. I'm really enjoying making these videos and taking you along the way. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and keeping the lights on and helping me up the production quality of these videos. I'll see you on the summit.